you could tell she loved every minute on that stage and she valued and respected every performance that she did. And that in itself was extraordinary. She just made you watch her. She made you look at what she wanted you to look at. If she raised an arm, you would look at that arm with her. She had a wonderful innate sense of theatre. So I think that whether you were out front watching her or whether you were on the stage with her, it was this immense sense of magic that she created, this superstar that in a way, there were so many other wonderful ballerinas, but when it was a Margot performance, there seemed to be an extra energy, both in the theatre and on the stage. I never saw her miss a pirouette or be oh. off No. You, you know, she no. was... Totally breathtaking just to see her. And she was the most wonderful actress, of course. She was, in a way, an understated superstar. She was Ashton's muse. And so I think... She had a wonderful, wonderful career and wonderful life, dancing whatever he did for her, which was fabulous. She always seemed to arrive just at the last minute before class, and I can remember she would open the door and we would know that she was coming in because everybody was already in class. She loved to do the boys' class in particular. She'd quietly go over to the bar and she'd say to the boys, may I, may I stand here? And they would go, of course. And they would back away so that she had enough room and everything. So she worked extremely quietly in class. She, she didn't push to the front. She wasn't first from the diagonal. She just fitted in, and I think that's what she wanted to do. She just wanted to fit in. But for all of us, she was a total inspiration. It was, it was fascinating because what I remember watching um, Margot in a lot of films is her pure technique, very clean technique. No affectations, no trying to push anything. Or, but, you know, it was very... Very, you know, it's very comfortable to watch because she was so in line with the music. Her musicality was stunning. And she used the highlights within the music to make something spectacular. Everything she did was worked out till the last degree. She risked nothing. So everything was calculated and worked out. And she rehearsed for hours. And she would get depressed as well that mm. she couldn't find the answer to a step. And it wasn't working for her and then she would not be afraid of asking people how it should be done in the in the studio she would do exactly the same as she would do on the stage you know all the emotion all the the little nuances of the choreography you know i still remember her in the balcony part of the when she puts romeo's hand on her chest and she used to always do a little flutter with her hand and that remained every time she did it a lot of it was her joy, just her uh, um, ability to resonate joy when she performed. If you've never seen Margaret Fontaine dance before, um, it's difficult to describe it because although this film, it doesn't capture the live performance. They are looking at a flat person, a two-dimensional person. And Margot, for me, was completely and utterly three-dimensional at all times. My impression of Margot was that she, she didn't really look at herself in the mirror. She sensed herself as a three-dimensional creature. She was videoed when she was towards the end of her career. Yes, yes. And people, young people, think, oh, she wasn't that good. You know, she, I don't know, they're looking for perfect arabesques and everything. Uh, you know, but she had beautiful lines. Oh. She, the most perfect line. And, perfect and we, were, line. we were taught those sort of yes, lines. No, that's a, that was, that was uh, Imperial Ballet training. Her line was superb. She didn't have the body that um, was athletic like bodies are today. And so she never whopped a leg up into arabesque. She took an arabesque. And the, the end of the fingers and the toe of the foot at the back was made beautiful spaces. I remember when I first saw her in Sleeping Beauty, for instance, her first step was to do an a la seconde, just thrust the leg out to the side, and instead of just extending it, 
she made a darting movement, like cutting through the air. Most people would just extend, part of ball ray, turn and a jump. She would sharply take and then pick up the time on the next step. So she accented certain moments and it created a slight surge of excitement within the audience. The speed, the brilliance, the use of the head, the accents, the stillness, that's what makes things come across the footlights. If there was a phrase where she'd be, if there was a bar to go, and she had to do an arabesque holding onto the prince's arms from one side of the stage to the other, she'd leave it to the last possible moment to run and collect herself in his arms. And we think she's never going to make it. Um, and, and the first nights of Sleeping Beauty in New York were electric. Well, I was just going to say, when yeah. she made her entrance, yeah. the audience applauded and they didn't stop applauding <laughs> all the way through her first entrance. <laughs> when she did that Rose Adagio, yeah. she, she didn't wobble around like people yeah. do when they take their hand off. She did it musically. Yeah. And she still, she was still. And I can remember when, it, when I first did it with her in New York, yeah. Jack Hart, the ballet master, said to me, you know how the boys queue up to take the balances at the end? Yeah. You know? And he said, you stand at the proscenium arch and you don't walk in until she takes her hand off. I mean, I felt like running. Oh, terrifying. And she just didn't move. She no. didn't move and she, on the music, put her hand out. I would just say, and this is, came from Ashton, which came from Pavlova, is the use of the eyes. This is something that dancers, I think, have lost a bit, or they feel they've, they've uh, been, if we ask them to do something, they feel, oh, it's a bit old-fashioned or silent movie. But boy, in a big theatre, does it come across, and you can do so much. And she knew how to look to the side and to understand how the light would catch her face and catch the whites of her eyes. All those little details that I think we take for granted, um, but they are such an important part of being a performer. Perhaps one of the reasons that she used her eyes and she was completely joined up, all the movements were completely harmoniously joined I mean, there was no way that she couldn't have her eyes exactly where they should be. I don't ever remember Margot looking in a mirror to try to get something right. Margot felt what she was doing. She sensed where her body was. Her smile was probably the most amazing piece of magnetic thing that you would travel to as soon as she came onto the stage. It was this smile and it was never failing. And my coach for, for my 20 years as a principal, he, he always used to say these wonderful details that Margot always used. And one of them was that she would put her tongue to the roof of her mouth when she smiled. And it gave, I suppose it, it helped her think about her smile and her presence on the stage. And it, it kept it alive, I suppose, that, that zest that she gave off. One was always aware, and I'm sure you'd agree with this, was how she, she worked with the music, what the music meant to her and how she phrased it. And she was never off the music. She was never late. She was never early. She was always absolutely at one, completely in the music. Her musicality, I call it phraseicality, not just dancing to, you know, a system of music, but to listen to the whole phrase and dance to that. At one point, I was meant to be the sort of swing girl in Birthday Offering. And I had to learn Margot's variation. And I remember asking her about her variation. And, you know, she sort of refused to say <laughs> anything about it, except that it's all in the music. Listen to the music. That's your clue. I first saw her in Firebird and as a student, and that was the revelation to me. I mean, it was seeing... Uh, a human being, a dancer, becoming something else. Um, 
quite electrifying performance and carrying in that opera house for miles. Whatever role she took on, she completely immersed herself in that role. Whether she was the firebird, whether she was Ondine. I think the moment of Ondine when she first came out of the fountain mm -hmm. and her hand and arm extending out of the water and sensing human air and pulling her hand back and then eventually coming out into this mortal world and tiptoeing around. I mean, it was complete magic. If you're thinking of a role and you're stepping into a role and what Margot, I think, um, encompassed was the character and, and the role that she was playing. Uh, she became that person. Even something, one of the peasants when she was doing Giselle, we would, we would be in tears. She moved us to tears on the stage. Another terrifying moment was when I was dancing the Queen of the Willies and in act two, she would come to plead for the life of Albrecht. And I remember on one occasion, I was absolutely certain that a tear escaped and ran down her face, ran down her cheek. You know, how could you possibly refuse somebody when they were pleading with you like that? You know, she was very expressive and, you know, I've seen plenty of footage of her and, and how she used her face and everything. Um, but she said, was much more about the choreography and how that was telling the story and through your body and how you brought that to life. You knew that you saw that wonderful line and the musicality and how ravishing she was. I mean, physically, the proportions were astounding. They were perfect. You were in awe of this amazingly well-proportioned and beautiful body. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons she was able to have such a, a, a long career was that the strain of the physicality of dancing was well balanced over her frame. It was perfectly proportioned. Because even in her 50s when she was performing, she still looked like a 20 year old. I was actually standing on the stage when she made her entrance in act one. And the impression was that she looked exactly how she'd looked when I was first in the corps de ballet and standing on the stage. And now here we were 12, 15 years on something. And she looked as youthful, as committed, as, and as magical. It was the performance. It was the fact that she completely became the 16 year old princess. Again, it was her birthday and she couldn't wait to celebrate it with the four princes and accept the roses. From Margot, you could learn so much. In later years as a dancer, I learned the sort of the salvational qualities of doing nothing. Just use economy in the movements and when to push it and when not to push it. It wasn't so much it was what she did as what she didn't do in her later career that was the amazing thing. You know, I used to say Margot never would do something just for the sake of doing it. She, she always had a reason to do it. I don't know if Margot ever really considered herself a teacher or was ever interested in teaching or coaching. She did relatively little of it. I think the, the way to learn about Margot was to watch her and to be around her and be inspired by her. I remember David said to her once, Margot, why don't you teach? Wouldn't you like to teach? And she was horrified. I, I can't teach. I couldn't teach. I couldn't teach. He said, but I've, I've seen your coach, Margot, and, you, and you're wonderful. And she said, yes, but all I'm doing is passing on what other people have said to me. But I think she also stepped back and she didn't over coach. You know, she, she would give these jewels. When she was coaching the girls for the mime scene, she was wonderful. And then one of the things I always remember her saying, first, you're very nervous, you're very nervous. And then she suddenly said, and then you get verbal diarrhea. I was desperately wanting to play the swan, to convince that I could be this swan, this real swan, this bird. And she said straight away, wrong, wrong thought. Mm -hmm. You are a woman and you're a woman first. And what is attracted, why, the prince is attracted to you is because of the woman. 
not because of the bird. The bird is the unusual mannerisms that are in you, but you have turned into a woman at this point when he meets you. A lot of it was also about um, simplifying um, the arms, the lines, uh, really clean, exact positioning, beautiful shapes, um, you know, like a silhouette, sort of um, creating beautiful silhouettes. Um, but again, the musicality was very important. The other thing that was very special was when she actually came for one hour to coach Firebird before I danced it for the first time. But of course, she didn't really speak about what she thought. She really spoke about what Kasavana had said to her. And she said, of course, Kasavana said, blah, blah, blah. And that was because Fokine had asked her, well, of course, you know, you mention these names and you're transported back in time. And, and I think the thing that I felt was such a privilege was the, the, the link in the chain that from Kasavana to Margot and to then Anne and me, and when we came to do our rehearsal with her, we felt sort of nearly ready to go on, but then she actually gave us all those wonderful clues about the firebird being capable of eating a man because Kasavana had said the firebird can eat a man. And I don't know why, but I just love that. <laughs> For me, I think what really resonates is her, her devotion to classical ballet and the world of classical ballet. Um, her understanding of the art and, and why it should exist um, and everything she represented was her integrity, her tenacity, the never giving up. Um. But Margot always used to say, never take yourself seriously, but always take your art form seriously. And I think that's incredibly true. So she sort of set a style and technique that hopefully that we will carry on and that we will uh, value. She should never be forgotten. And it shouldn't just be, oh, well, she was a famous ballerina. We treasured those performances. I mean, there must have been so many of them, but they were, well, they just stand out in one's memory.